dear life good evening everyone welcome to our focus online lecture 182 and this is retina session 34 today we have with us dr pramod bhande sir who will be talking on a very important topic and uh, that is proliferative diabetic retinopathy the management approach i request dr rajit babu sir to please introduce dr pramod sir uh good evening everyone um, today we are having a esteemed uh, guest faculty that is uh, in the form of um, pramod bhende uh, many of the people who are interested in retina know him very well i he do not require a special introduction but however he is uh, one of the earlier uh, batches of shankar natralay and you know uh, vitor retina is very well known in shankar natralay and he uh, tremendously contributed to the growth of the vitor retina department in shankar natralay and uh, now he is heading the uh, vitor retina uh, department in addition he is uh, having uh, several publications and a very good presenter actually he presents very practical points and uh, he uh, always gives a uh, pearls which are really worth practicing so if you see his uh, surgical uh, videos or even uh, the, the surgical steps in other uh, vitreo retina procedures they are uh, worth watching and then uh, you can practice in the clinic very well and uh, his achievements if you compare it's very very many but um, he is very down to earth personality and while speaking to him he do not like uh, look like that he has achieved so many accolades and today uh, the hard seats you can be very free to interact with him because uh, he will give you a lot of uh, practical tips and it's very good he is a very good, great teacher with whom you can interact well and uh, learn a lot with this uh, few words uh, i expect uh, pramod uh, take uh, this opportunity to share his knowledge with all the students uh, post graduates and uh, pramod you have 40 to 45 minutes for uh, this lecture and uh, after that you can we can um, entertain the questions from the hot seats right. over to you pramod thank you thank you ajit for a wonderful uh, and like a over inflated i would say introduction and thanks it's not inflated uh, thanks, for, yeah. <laughs> it's thanks santosh absolutely and practical team, yeah, santosh and his team for invitation and having me here uh, just i'm trying to focus for mainly as santosh suggested post graduates and uh, general ophthalmologists probably not going to hardcore vr surgery i will just touching upon at the end but basically he wanted practical approach for a case to case basis we'll have go uh, so you can have my uh, yes sir yeah. uh, you can this is a uh, okay perfectly fine sir okay and so i'll go ahead with so basically proliferative diabetic retinopathy is a vascular proliferative disorder in diabetics leading to growth of new vessels on the retinal surface optic disc iris and angle so we'll go over this certain step by step how to approach these eyes with history clinical examination systemic evaluation uh, investigations and then management so coming to history we need to know duration of the diabetes duration of the symptoms ask for aso associated underlying systemic factors like hypertension kidney disease particularly they are always associated with long standing diabetics um where patients taking any medications and especially history of sudden worsening of the symptoms that's some, again important thing clinical examination will go clinical features in detail but basically what includes the baseline vision anterior segment examination specifically look for iris and angle neovascularization and fundus evaluation using using indirect ophthalmoscopy and slit lamp via microscopy look for a, how well diabetes is controlled check um, blood pressure ask for a renal disease renal parameters and patient cardiac status 
coming to investigation basically what we know is a good metabolic control is an integral part of diabetic retinopathy management and apart from routine your fasting postprandial blood sugar hba1c look for a serum urea creatinine particularly when initial evaluation when you are looking at patient has already done this investigation please look through or get it done to assess his systemic status specifically coming to ocular investigation imaging is a, again important part and which complements the treatment approach to a patient with a diabetic retinopathy in particularly now we are just restricting to pdr here fluorescence and angiography is important for baseline evaluation of retinal vascular pattern it though we may not need to do fluorescence angiography for obvious cases with having a new with new vascularization but definitely ffa helps us to detect subtle new vessels ischemia perfusion defects and other changes it helps in guiding laser particularly for uh, patients with a diabetic macular edema and when you are planning fill in pan retinal laser photocoagulation in eyes with astroid hyalosis when you see here practically retinal details could not be seen with fundus fluorescence angiography probably you will evaluate you will be able to evaluate fundus in much better way and plan your treatment accordingly well etdrs has given us uh, seven field imaging and it was standard protocol for long time till we have now ultra wide field imaging and current studies when you look at it ultra wide field imaging gives almost 11.7% of retinal new vessels detected outside this area of seven field and also it get detected almost 3.9 times more non perfusion areas and 1.9 times more new vascularizations this is just to see one example here this is a clarice picture having a new new vessels and non perfusion area beyond seven fields and also you can assess adequacy of pan retinal laser photocoagulation in these eyes Now coming to oct more commonly we used to assess macular area and macular edema specifically in diabetic eyes but it also help us assessing vitro macular interface to look for a extent of postrahyaloid separation and especially vitreous kyxis because that can help us to plan further management because this is an example where now patient not responding to anti vegaps when you look on the oct you have a epiretinal membrane tractional component which is holding the retina up there and the another dark picture down showing uh, diabetic tractional maculopathy having a skytic changes as well and these are again few different pattern showing focal attachments or broad attachments or even macular hole which can very well documented detected and you have detected uh, treatment can be planned accordingly and these are eyes usually does not help for uh, uh, medical line of treatment and in, eventually they need surgical intervention coming to octa again helps to detect the layer specific perfusion changes subtle new vessels which can otherwise easily missed and particularly with now having octa even wide field 12 mm scan 15 mm scans we are going through and even beyond that so uh, this is very a useful tool what we have with us now and near here you have here interface here interface lab when you look at it subtle new vessels at Uh, we we are in uh, inter uh, interface can easily be detected and being a non invasive indicate like a modality of imaging it's uh, probably fairly safe in patient those are having other lot of systemic issues and where we cannot do fundus fluorescence angiography coming to ultrasonography basically in uh, useful in eyes with a media opacity it helps us to assess the status of the retina uh, to look at whether attached or tractional detachment or have a combined detachment if there is a detachment its location configuration as you see here doing either focal attachment or you have a hemop like a tinting or the last image right side down you can see the table top we add in along with the uppermost uh, arrow showing vitreous kyxis as well the whether status of the pvd also can be assessed particularly when having a dense vitreous hemorrhage and you cannot Um, see the fundus properly 
Now, look at this clinical spectrum of the diabetic of a proliferative or retinopathy. We have a right palm, just small isolated hemorrhage and fluid vessels. We have a dense vitreous hemorrhage to combine fractional detachment. So we'll go probably one by one uh, with this. These are various scenarios what we are dealing with. So eyes with a PDR having a single isolated new vessel, which is a, is a 63 year old male. Uh, uh, had recently diagnosed as a diabetic, vision is 618, fundus picture shows some heart exudates at the posterior pole and suspected new vessels almost to this area of inferior. Fundus fluorescent angiography confirm this area of new vessels. Now to how to manage this case. Basically is isolated new vessels, not much macular edema. So possible options, what we can have here, we have a close observation. You can go ahead with conventional PRP, can have targeted laser or intraventral antivagers. But in eyes where you have poor compliance for follow, advanced diabetic disease in other eye, poor control of systemic parameters, or if there are wide areas of non provision probably in our scenario, PRP would be the preferred option. Targeted laser, basically, what does it mean? So you laser only to ischemic or CNP areas and avoid areas of perfused retina. So it can be tried in eyes where you are dealing with a non-high risk PDR. The advantage is you are not destroying the healthy well perfused retina, but disadvantage is these eyes needs very close follow to look for a fresh new vessels. And eventually you may have to treat entire retina and do PRP over a period of time. Looking at the intravitreal anti of monotherapy, yes, it can be with current evidence, suggest this, is, this can be one of the options. However, you need to give repeated injections. The cost factor is involved, indirect cost is used, and more frequent injection, careful, Lifelong follow-up is again necessary. And if you fail, and which is shown with the evidence we have, we'll come to that again. If patient fail to come back for follow-up, there's a reactivation and sometimes even progress to even new vascular glaucoma and end-stage disease. Eyes with a high-risk PDR with a no traction. As you see here, fundus picture, this neovascularization, few images, is a 55-year-old male, non-diabetic, and vision is at 6, 6, and 6, no obvious traction. So it's important to have a good control of diabetes and systemic parameter. This is again, uh, Octa, the same patient. And evidence and our experience suggests probably PRP is the best option in these eyes. Um, of course, you need to continue good control of diabetes and patient has to understand we, and we have to sit with him. We have to counsel him, make him understand consequences if follow-up is not done properly, if diabetes is not controlled properly, what it can lead to. Now, role of like protocol is DRCR net is compare the safety and efficacy of pan-retinal laser photocoagulation versus intravitreal anti major particularly ranibizumab. And what we realize is the advantage of PRP being a potential to be completed either one or two settings. There is no risk of endophthalmitis because you are not poking needle inside the eye and uh, definitely have a long-term good uh, stability. And the most important problem was when you're looking at a long-term follow-up, there is loss of follow-up where you can, in that situation probably, you can have disastrous problem if your patient is on multiple anti vagap injection. So looking at a current scenario for high-risk PDR, PRP is a still mainstay as suggested by DRS. And when you should start PRP, probably earliest as soon as you diagnose the patient as having a high-risk PDR. Uh, so according to DRS, what is high-risk PDR is basically new vessels at a within one disc area of the disc with a preretinal or vitreous hemorrhages or NVD of the size of one four to one three disc area without preretinal hemorrhages or vitreous hemorrhage and NV more than half disc with preterm hemorrhage or vitreous. So when you see any one of these, probably it's 
indication for pan retinal laser photocoagulation and etdrs goes one step further if you was and suggest prp if there is very severe npdr or early pdr without even high risk characteristics particularly in type 2 diabetics also if there is a new vascularization of iris or, or angle again is the indication for prp so uh, how you do prp basically mild to moderate intensity burns a spacing of 1 to 1/2 1 1/2 burn width apart it should be non confluent extending anterior to equator all around 360 degree and one disc area all from the disc nasal disc margin up to the arcade or superior inferiorly and probably two to three disc area away from temporal side and this uh, we can complete the pan retinal laser photocoagulation over two to three sittings generally that is recommended so additional photocoagulation or fill in prp what we all call it is can be added or done if there is failure of new vascularization to regress if there is increasing or new area of new vessels are seen or if there is iris new vessels or there is associated vitreous hemorrhage and when you do pan fill in prp should put give the bones between initial leg scars go via for the peripheral and come to a posterior pole probably now one disc area away from the center of the macula so this is a 48 year old male had a loss of vision history of 2 months diabetic since last 5 years and left eye vision is 624 and have associated macular edema as seen in our city as well how we should go about obviously this is a typical session i am not going to go further detail there is a role of anti vage of monotherapy but as we discussed earlier most of us prefer to use anti vage of for a macular edema along with pan retinal laser photocoagulation but if your oct shows or there is obvious traction or uh, pull threatening or involving the fovea probably surgery would be the option uh, prefer option in these cases now if you have a retinopathy with traction but macula is not yet involved and look at this like looking at the evidence the tractional detachment tends to remain stable over prolonged period as i said 20 33% incidence of progression to macula over 3 years so these patients uh, with a extra macular trd can be observed safely at a regular interval obviously you need a regular follow up for this patient and by chance if you are planning laser avoid i mean laser burn should be at least two disc area away from the edge of the trd to minimize the risk of Track, uh, going into combined RD. This is one patient having a DOV since last one year. Base corrected vision in the right eye was 636, left eye was 67.5. Has asymmetric PDR and carotid Doppler shows right carotid artery stenosis, as we see here. Basically, is dealing with a ischemic uh, syndrome. And we did a like a heavy. extensive pan retinal laser photocoagulation in this eye which help eventually to regress the neovascularization this is other eye left type of the patient which is absolutely normal so coming that this brings us to like a pdr along with nvi or nva and eyes with neovascular glaucoma uh, there is a wonderful article review article in igo published few years back we have pulled the data from uh, uh, all major institutes in india i think i won't go into detail in this prayer slide but actually i would recommend strongly that that article should be read by everybody but to sum up what we need is when you are dealing with nvi nva early aggressive treatment definitely helps to regress neovascularization of angle and iris with uh, helps to preventing basically blinding complications particularly these eyes need to be detected early by before they reach the angle closure state and generally you get reasonably good prognosis in these eyes if eyes with no light perception and if they don't have pain you just observe these eyes but painful blind eye sometime you can try topical cyclopropagic and steroid but if pain persists probably you can have diode cpc anteretinal cryopexy and worst possible scenario evisceration can be the option but that generally we want to avoid as best possible coming to the pdr with a vitreous hemorrhage is a 58 year old male Uh, had a loss of vision of one week duration 
diabetes since last 14 years and had laser both eyes two years back. When you look at this fundus picture, you see there was uh, some view, a major part of retina could be seen. There was no vitreous extraction. And because of recent onset of recent history of loss of vision, we did uh, fill in PRP if the skip areas are seen in these eyes and continue close follow-up. These eyes generally need a regular follow-up and as him keeps on clearing, you may need to add on additional laser if necessary. Now this is uh, uh, another scenario. Again, with recent onset vitreous hemorrhage. However, some, um, some view was there. There was no obvious macular traction, no previous laser was done. So we followed up and OCT we could do. Obviously, there was no obvious macular edema. Minimal thickening is there, but uh, it can be observed at this stage. So we decided, now our treatment option probably here, if view is there to some extent, and you see a laser, un, not un, retina, which is not laser, so you can add some more laser, but continue maybe follow up at two to three weeks, and then keep on adding laser and complete your pan-retinal photocoagulation may over multiple sittings as hemorrhage keeps on clearing. Counseling of the patient is obviously very, very important. This is one patient having a 15-year history of diabetes, sudden loss of vision, vision was counting finger, there was no laser done previously, so no view of the fundus. So ultrasonography was performed to assess the retinal status. Yes, retina was attached incomplete PVD, but there was no obvious traction. So decided to continue observing this patient as a close watch, two to three weeks. Every time screening of uh, when you do, if there is no view, is recommended to do ultrasonography to assess the retinal status. If possible, look with indirect ophthalmoscopy and obviously monitoring of intraocular pressure. And as media clears, laser can be added. However, if patient develops neovascularization of iris or angle for a period of time, or develop hemolytic or ghost cell glaucoma, probably that is an indication for early surgery. This is another patient with a five-year history of diabetes, loss of vision since last three months, and no fundus view. Now, this was old, with this hemorrhage history more than two uh, three months, fundus of view was not there. So probably because of this, it's difficult for to assess the macular status and how the disease is progressing. And that's when, and obviously if this is progresses further, probably it will be indicated like a, eventually her vision can get compromised. So vitrectomy is a preferred option in this scenario, particularly not old non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage. Coming partly with the cataract surgery, sorry, uh, uh, patient is, if patient is having a cataract, obviously indication is there for cataract surgery associated PDR. And if retina could be seen, good metacritical control can be achieved. And I would suggest to treat retinopathy before considering cataract surgery, do pan-retinal laser photocoagulation, aggressive management of NVI, NVA, and NVG present, and plan cataract surgery after probably maybe three to six months once the diabetic retinopathy process gets stabilized. Of course, close monitoring for worsening of DR and DME following surgery is, is very, very important. However, sometimes cataract is there and also there is no view of the retina as well. So we need to assess ultrasonography will be necessary for posterior segment evaluation. You are seeing here, like a fractional detachment or ultrasound or UBM in a post vitrectomy eyes, particularly when you see this eye here, like UBM done post vitrectomy with a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage and having a fibrovascular polypression at sclerotomy site. Now, this scenario obviously warrant early cataract surgery, followed by detailed fundus evaluation, preferably on the table, and then plan your diabetic retinopathy management accordingly. If after cataract, you can see the fundus. And if you think laser is adequate, you can finish with the laser probably first sitting on the table if option is available all earliest possible in a post-operative period. But if you are associated with vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment, 
combined cataract surgery and vitrectomy can be performed. So this brings us to vitrectomy in a PDR. So grassly indication can be divided into three groups. One is indication, first indication and commonest indication, probably for non-clearing uh, media opacities, which includes non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage, you have asteroid hyalosis, or have dense premacular hemorrhages or premacular fibrosis. So early vitrectomy is indicated in vitreous hemorrhage, particularly in young diabetics or one eye patients or when hemorrhage is there in both eyes, no previous laser done. We have extensive proliferation underlying or associated rubiosis or iris angle neovascularization. But patient with a complete PVD, prior exit, uh, extensive PRP or associated systemic status, which does not, uh, our patient is not fit for surgery. Obviously, we don't have choice but to wait. Tractional com uh, detachments, combined detachment, and uh, tractional uh, maculopathy probably is another group where vitrectomy is indicated. Now, when TRD is uh, indication for TRD, what you say is when I said Rick, uh, with an extra previous present previous slide, I showed that extra fluvial TRD can be safely observed. So obviously, when you operate, when you have traction detachment, when TRD is already involving the macula, or obviously threatening the macula with a documented progression towards the macula, or you are having a detachment behind vitreous hemorrhage, precluding the evaluation of the macula. So. Um, the goal of vitrectomy in these eyes would be to remove the media opacity, to relieve anteroposterior and tangential retinal fractions, to stabilize the diabetic neovascular process, and removal of the vitreous scaffolds, removal of the surface fibrovascular proliferation, and laser to ischemic retina. Preoperative evaluation includes baseline vision, look for rubiosis, angle neovascularization, uh, NVG. Pupil dilatation and less status help us to plan the surgical steps and status of the uh, disc macula extent of the TRD also help us to not only plan the management, also discuss prognosis with the patient and his relatives. So we prefer most of the cases can be done under local anesthesia, but depending on the patient's um, compliance, you can decide about general anesthesia. So the basic steps include score vitrectomy, um, opening posterior highlight, removal of sublylide hemorrhage. I'll go over to that. This is basically where to start. So basically, it's initiate vitrectomy with uh, clearing the uh, sclerotomy area. As you see here, cutter is moving just near to sclerotomy area. And once vision media starts slowly becoming clear, you extend your cutter towards anterior and mid vitreous. Once you finish that part, generally what you need to do is what? Uh, look at the trunk, like uh, opening the poster highlight and where you should open practically, probably that helps us previous ultrasonography if you are done. Look at the gap, maximum clearance between the poster highlight and the retina and probably that meridian, that clock hour helps you that safely you can just cut open the poster highlight and then extend all around 360 degree to get your trunk, get your vitreous cone as you see here going all around here. And once you have done that, it's just you have taken care of anterior posterior attraction, then comes to your posterior pole. And what we call as membrane surgery, which is one of the most challenging steps, as retina is generally thin, ischemic, usually have a florid extensive proliferation, and you invariably have some amount of bleeding. And this bleeding also sometimes compromises the vision during your membrane dissection. And the incidence of iatrogenic break is as high as 45% in diabetes eyes, even in experienced hands. So just to complete the list now, what the typical two techniques are described, segmentation, where scissors are, you see these two videos, segmentation and delamination. Uh, in segmentation, scissors are at a right angle to the retina to cut the large sheet of bridging operating with fibrous tissue in a smaller island to relieve the tangential traction and then isolated this uh, islands, you can just chew it up. As against in delamination, scissors are parallel to the retinal plane. So you transect epicenters to remove membrane as one or more large piece. So uh, basically in a segmentation, because you are cutting across the vessel, there's a high risk of bleeding, okay? A high risk of reproliferation later on. But technically it is easy. 
but in time delamination you are transecting the epicenters so generally this dissection is much more complete and once this section is completed i think generally these eyes do much better but technically it is more difficult but actually when you have a practical approach superficially each technique may represent different approach but basically all they achieve the same objective in a different orders and in most of the cases all the vr surgeon will agree that basically what technique we use is a combination of everything like just now what i did is a segmentation then now i am just trying to do lid delamination separating this membrane edge here and that's why and sometimes just combination of everything in a one given case you generally don't do just one technique in one eye another technique and another eye basically the location and pattern of the tr membranes guide us how we should go about so another question is where you should go to from periphery to center or center to periphery again it depends on rd configuration surgeon's experience and available instrumentation but what is more important is identifying the correct plane for dissection and once you get a correct plane uh, then dissection either way you go is easier this is a typical case what you called as vitreous kyst or second membrane so this is what i am holding with the forceps is not actually the age of the membrane something thin may she thin membrane going beyond this if you can see in this video just and then i am lifting it this is this is actually a right plane and that is where you should look for not this obviously looking plane because if you miss that plane then your dissection can be messy you can have a lot of hemorrhages and lot of other risk of hydrogenic breaks create but you get a right plane then you can identify precise those epicenters and you can cut those epicenter with a minimal uh, hydrogenic issues with the changing trends we have a new high speed cutters wide angle visualization systems you have a improved illuminations multifunction instruments uh, pre op anti vegas will come to little bit uh, later so can you hear us and 3d it i intro the end of the probe and what it helps us to allow work very close to the retina and also have a no um, there is an auto network uh, issue so there is some problem with the connection sir better use as a <laughs> the other hand to dissect the membrane and cut this epicenters one i one exactly working like the caesar Sir, sorry to interrupt. There is some problem with the connection. Could you redo this video, sir? Can you hear me, sir? It is not audible to him. Right, sir. I'll just speak to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. once. Um. as uh, um, pramod probably we need to redo that uh, uh, video hello yeah now you are audible okay you, you can uh, yes, play that video again and uh, from there we will uh, continue the presentation pramod sir there was some connection issue so we missed okay. your last video anyway this is seeing this now sorry No, so you'll have to reshare no. your screen, sir. Re, actually, reshare the screen. Re okay, sorry. One minute. Let me go back. Sorry for inconvenience. No problem, sir. No problem. Take your time, sir. Something, something happened. Just is it okay now? Yes, sir. From with this video onwards, sir, we missed your. Uh... Yeah. Yes, sir. So perfect. I'll just keep this. Then this video we finish, right? Yeah. No, yeah. sir. We missed this, this video. This we need to redo. Okay. So basically, okay. So this is just showing typically multi using multi-function instrument and port optimization where I use a twenty-five gauge combined light and irrigation. 
and one hand forceps using uh, and other hand i having a uh, this 25 gauge cutter so typically working more like a scissor here now as a spatula also so basically doing both the jobs and practically eliminate the use and you need eliminate the use of scissors in most of these eyes obviously few sir cases definitely will need to but most of the eyes now you can manage uh, using this 25 gauge and particularly now 10000 cut bevel cutter when we have uh, uh, like a dissection become very very easy this is one of the eye showing massive proliferation pre and post uh, photograph both the eyes of the same patient so coming to anti vegf uh we intra vitre uh, using more common the adjunct to the vitrectomy purpose is to reduce the vascularity of the fluorid proliferation thereby it reduce the make the surgery technically easier because fibrovascular proliferation usually easy to separate from the retina there is less intraoperative bleeding so less diathermy so reduce post operative inflammation and eventually we have a better intraoperative visualization and with overall reduce the surgical time but what is uh, important is when uh, there is a rapid regression of fibrovascular proliferation but there is again reactivation any time after 2 weeks so surgery should be planned in a window of 3 to 10 days once you inject the anti vegf in the eye and so always ensure that systemic clearance and other investigations are done before you take the patient for surgery uh, take the patient for injection and by chance something you miss probably you may have to re inject before before the surgery and this is one of the pre avastin and then post avastin mass significant regression of the proliferation and post vitrectomy i 6 weeks later the surgery went up very comfortably to summarize ptr is a proliferative vascular retinopathy seen in diabetics pan retinal laser photocoagulation is still the mainstay of treatment for ptr TRD and CRD now are the commonest indications for vitrectomy in PDR. Role of anti VEGF as a monotherapy is still debatable, but in advanced diabetic eye, pre-surgery intravit intravital anti VEGF helps to minimize intraoperative bleeding for a more complete removal of the fibrovascular proliferation. Modern surgical techniques and multifunction instruments allows faster and safer surgery, and early treatment and good metabolic control gives better final outcome. However, uh, good metabolic control, as I said, and long-term regular follow-up is an essential part for these patients. So I acknowledge uh, help from Dr. Rajiv, my fellow Dr. Arka Parva, and Dr. Sneha Giridhar for helping me to collect the data and particularly cases uh, for this presentation. So this is the last case where I was telling again, 25 gauge cutter and massive proliferation. Um, is it to dissect out with using anti vegf so practically very minimal bleeding in these eyes thank you very much for patient hearing and i'll stop here now thank you so much sir for the wonderful lecture and uh, i have told uh, the post graduates earlier also that this is quite an important lecture because it definitely will come either as a long question or a short question and or in the viva and even otherwise the questions will always be asked on diabetic retinopathy and it will follow through throughout life so it's a very important topic for all of us and thanks sir for enlightening us with certain points which we pro probably would have not noticed uh, dr ajit sir would you like to uh, add some comments yeah i think uh, pramod has uh, really covered the whole topic very well um as i told you in the beginning that uh, he has uh, touched upon all the basic uh, aspects of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and uh, different uh, settings for uh, with retinal surgery in pro advanced proliferative diabetic retinopathy and his video shows that how nicely you can uh, deal with even the advanced proliferative diabetic retinopathy that's, that's very very clear in that and uh, probably we without wasting much time we will first go on to the heart seats there are a lot of questions are there yes, uh, pramod uh, sure, we, sure. Will, uh, we need to address their uh, questions first and then uh, additional any comments are there we will uh, deal with it the first dr shoshni she has asked 
please explain yellow green laser and red laser actually yellow is yellow laser is different green laser is different and red laser is different uh, she has asked the indications for prp with uh, different uh, these three lasers she well, mentioned two but it is three lasers yeah basically again probably hemorrhages other things you can just view. more commonly what all of us use now is green laser green laser yeah. to have yeah. a diode red but most of the time, um, yes, diode disadvantage is uh, laser burn, usually they are deeper. So they are more painful for a patient. Yeah. Not that easy to titrate because where you have pigmentation, suddenly you have a much larger burn, heavier burn, and where less pigmentation, you have a burn may not be that heavy. So titration becomes sometimes difficult. And, so, and as you see probably next day or subsequent day, these burn, what you see during treatment, and later on, they are definitely much larger than what actually you anticipate. Sometimes you aim at doing like one, one and a half one with apart laser. Actually, when you see sometimes subsequent follow-up, they may look confluent also. So when you're planning diet, have a, try to do a light, lighter burns and probably have a more spacings. Uh, yellow laser, because not all the centers having probably hemorrhages, so that thing probably you can. But most of the time you get away with, uh, I think green is uh, like a workhorse probably, I would say. And it's much more compatible uh, for patients as well compared to diode. Uh, then uh, we'll move on to the next uh, question by Dr. Divya. She said, uh, ba based on what clinical findings you decide whether tractional retinal detachment is stable or unstable? Regular follow-up. Regular follow-up, yes. Regular follow-up, patient symptoms, whether vision is worsening or not. You can have a, uh, uh, obviously, sequential OCT you can do and look for a macular status. The most important, probably, patient symptom, if there's worsening symptoms, that's a probably, a, because that is what patient is going to notice and going to be, come for a consultation. And other, uh, you can have subject, uh, objective test, like as you said, you are, check the vision, clinical for picture, and obviously OCT. That probably helped you. And another clinical finding that uh, you can observe, uh, Divya, is uh, that the whether the fibrous, uh, fibrovascular proliferation is more vascular or fibrous. If it is fibrous, then the tractional RD is likely to be more stable. Uh, if it is fibrovascular or vascular, predominantly vascular, then it can progress. That is one thing. If one uh, follow-up only, you need to decide, then that is one thing which is a uh, very important finding which you need to observe. Second is the proximity to the macular center is very, very essential in uh, tractional detachments in uh, deciding for any interventions or no interventions and observation. Then uh, Shohni, Dr. Shohni again uh, asked uh, how we induce PVD during vitrectomy without traction. This is yeah. an, yeah. This is a, probably, I would say, is a full lecture on it I had. And I just wanted this to keep as a basic. Yeah, just tell the methods uh, which you yeah. use for uh, PVD. Probably, probably for the, if you are lucky enough, you have an isolated polyp, probably, uh, um, I mean, most of us are happy if there is already PVD. All VR yes. people, people will be happy. But yes, it does not happen. And most of the diabetes, they have probably incomplete PVD. Now, if posterior hyaloid is adherent to the disc, there is no proliferation allowed, only vitreous. is like any other regular case. You can induce PVD using cutter suction. Use a little bit higher suction. Go probably start on a nasal side, separating from the disc. You can use tricot, obviously, to stain the vitreous if necessary. And gently, you start separating around the disc and then extend towards the periphery. But what happens while extending periphery? In real you have some neovascular tuft which are holding the posterior highlight. Uh, and when you reach those neovascular tuft and you try to exit, to pull on it, either you are lucky enough, they can separate, but can have a tiny bleed as there. Or sometimes they will leave small break in the retina there. So you, when you reach those prolips, reach those tufts, so rather than pulling directly over those probably over that pulling poster highlight rather, you go close to them, flush to the retina and because new cutters allow us now to close, almost shaving is allowed now and safely we can do. So 
cut those prolifs, those stuffs flush, <coughs> and then again use your suction, continue suction to separate rest of the thing. That is one thing. Second thing, if you have fibrous tissue stuck to the retina all around, sometimes you may have to use your either MVR blade or bend needle to create the edge for your posterior hyaloid. And then go on separately. Sometimes entire posterior hyaloid is stuck to the retina, then probably you need a bimanual dissection and go slowly, gradually starting from the disc. If you have a <coughs> peripheral PVD and posterior pole where the polyp is there, it is stuck. Then the video I showed earlier, you do open the posterior hyaloid, do truncation, <laughs> peripheral vitreous, you can relieve, and come back to posterior pole here, and then try to get a cleavage plane and then start dissecting it in or dissecting out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not sorry, but if you think that PVD induction in a non-proliferative simple uh, cases, PVD induction is totally different from a proliferative diabetic retinopathy where there is high risk PDR and advanced PDR they are there. When the proliferation is too much, either you can go from center to periphery approach or mm -hmm. periphery to center approach. And uh, he has enumerated what all the different techniques that can be done when you are dealing with over the disc of PVD induction. Certain times when the proliferation is too much in the periphery, it's always better to start from the disc because uh, as uh, Pramod in his lecture very clearly told that if you get the correct plane, then there will, the hemorrhage will be minimal. So when you are proceeding from the disc, the chances of you going into the right plane is high. So you can go the proceed from disc then to the periphery. But when the peripheral PVD is already there and there is only proliferation around the disc, it's better to come from the periphery, induce, uh, create, uh, eat away the, all the peripheral PV, uh, already induced uh, posterior vitreous detachment and then deal with the membranes as uh, he has clearly told. Now we will go on to the next question. Uh, is uh, again uh, operating microscope phototoxicity. What precautions we take? Operating microscope phototoxicity not an issue because most of us work with the light microscope light, light off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but okay. uh, yes, for light, uh, postgraduates light. that is very important <laughs> because uh, they are doing uh, cataract surgery. Yes, for cataract uh, surgery they don't uh, change the positions and all. Uh, yeah, keep that on changing the mask, yeah. yeah, and new new microscope, you can have an, a central blind spot, a dark spot, you can get it. And yeah. obviously, don't leave the cornea dry. Yes. Uh, and for, as far as VR is concerned, uh, probably keep light pipe as away as possible. Yes. Don't keep light focusing all the time at one point. And particularly when macular dissection or the macro you're doing, probably um, not having a light very close. And uh, and for a longer period of time. Yeah. Means you stay away from the retina or with the light pipe, keep moving the light pipe while doing the surgery. That is very important. If you keep it at, at a single point, high likelihood that you will get the phototoxicity. And with new, again, microscope and machines, you have multiple filters as well that definitely helps us to reduce toxicity. Uh, filters when you are going with the light pipe inside, no filters will not work. Filters will work for you for uh, your uh, eye. Yeah, I agree, retina, agree that way. Not Correct, for agree, uh, agree. the patient retina. That's true. Uh, PRP usually, what's the maximum power? Uh, Dr. Divya has asked, what is the maximum power you use for PRP? Probably she has no experience with PRP. You can you can enumerate. Yeah, that's uh, it. One of the slide was there. Maximum power, basically, um, well, PRP using indirect arthroscope. I think I went up to even thousand. The reason being, basically, I generally do not look at the console. What I look at the intensity of the burn on the retina, so, and what I told is mild to moderate, where you need a grayish, yellowish burn, not a white burn. So you start with a low intensity, probably low energy, maybe hundred, hundred and probably hundred. I would say and keep on step gradually increasing increasing till you get that mild to moderate 
like intensity burn. As long as you are not getting burn there at all, you are not damaging the retina rather. Yes, chorite is absorbing energy. Inflammation will be definitely more later on. But yeah, the maximum I went once, I think I said generally do now. Generally, maximum, I think, depending on media is cataract or patient cooperation, periphery where you have to reach, maybe 300, sometimes 300, 400 maximum. But generally, you manage around 150 to 200. Once, yes, I reach 1,000. If you wanted how, how maximum I use, yes. Uh, Dr. Divya, its main uh, point for uh, la laser photocoagulation is uh, the grade of the burn. Never go by the power. Right, Pramod? Yes. Grade yes, of the exactly burn is more important rather right. than the power. You never see, the, he already told, I will not see the console. I will see the grade of the burn and uh, it is required for that. Off white burns, you should never give. I agree. Uh, and grade two uh, burns probably the best. Mm -hmm. And um, if media haziness is there, you may have to increase the power or the duration. Certain times when you are not give, uh, getting good uh, burns with um, the powers which are higher, then you increase the duration and certain times it will work. Or you reduce the spot size. You can play with the parameters actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it is safer to increase the duration rather than duration. increasing energy because uh, reducing spot size or heavy burn, sometimes you can have Brooks membrane rupture. So yes. slow cooking is better than having a very high energy and creating the burst. And another important aspect of uh, this grade of the burn is if there is a TRD, the elevated retina, you should not try to get the burns. Yeah, that's Again, what I you said. May create at a... least two disc area away from the edge of the TRD and or polyp. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, then uh, uh, Rajneesh was asking how many sittings should laser be completed? Well, uh, with uh, the really standard protocol is somewhere between two to three sitting. Generally, what we do, depending on patient convenience, yes, people are there, they, they have done even single sitting. Okay, and uh, Pascal probably where total yes. energy, cumulative energy use is much less. So even people are doing in one single sitting with without causing much problem. Ideally speaking, you should have a one sitting over a period of one week or two weeks if you want to do, but this is not practicable most of the time for us because for particularly patients are coming out station and if they have to go back, uh, probably once, maybe we generally routine practices do a three or sittings over three days, which probably is not an ideal one. Maybe you give at least two, three days gap in each sitting and over three sitting, generally three sittings. But sometimes patient compliance, other issues can have a three, four sittings as well. What is the risk of uh, doing? I'm not asking promote to you. Yeah, I'm asking to the hot seats. Mm -hmm. um, it's What is the risk of uh, completing uh, uh, the PRP in single sitting with a standard laser machine? Pascal is different. Anyone can answer? You can type your answers. Usual increased IOP, no, anything anything else? You all can try just. Just take a shot. Just try. Out. How does it matter? Yeah, yeah. Sony, Anusha, Divya, Rashnish, anybody can answer something? Okay, Pramod, you can finish off. <laughs> yeah, we just said because it's like uh, doing too much of energy laser inducing basic is the commonest issue is uh, for adult detachment. Sometimes can develop exudative detachment as well. That's the most common uh, complication. You can even sometimes you see it with even our like a 600, 700, one few patients you see. And if you have developed choroidal detachment, probably you defer subsequent sittings till detachment settles down. Yes. You can treat with the steroid because you are inducing inflammation and excessive inflammation can lead to this complication. Yeah. So, uh, exudative RD and choroidal detachment are likelihood with uh, higher number of burns with standard laser machine. And whenever it happens, at least you should wait for two weeks period with uh, topical steroids and maybe mediatic uh, drops. Uh, 
and once the uh, uh, choroidal detachment and exudative detachment settles down, then you can take up for the further settings of uh, panretinal photocoagulation. And um, while uh, any other questions from the hot seats? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a few questions, and I would like to say that yeah, Sonia please, please. did answer to the questions by seeing increased IOP, retinal burns, and photoreceptor loss. Good efforts. I'm happy to see you all answering. Uh, there are two questions that so we have besides these. One is that before doing PPV for um, PDR, uh, when should anti vegf be given? How many hours prior to the procedure? Actually, that's what I answered. I said, see, preferably somewhere between three to five days, not hours. Yeah, not hours. So, Definitely. Not hours. Preferably around three to five days we wait to have its effects. So when like a vascularization probably regresses to some extent, and that's a safety window, even you can go up to, I would say, 10 days. You have a effect within 24 hours, generally. But you give generally, and 48 hours probably is a, you can say, very good effect. So generally that window of two to five days or three to five days or seven days should be okay. Looking at your convenience, other logistics, when you work out, your surgery schedule and all those things. So plan in a way, so generally what we do is when we give in plan anti vegf injection, we already plan a surgery date and work down backward and give injection and ensure uh, systemic parameters are under control. Uh, everything is done, yeah. that, uh, homework is done before. Yeah, while uh, injecting the anti vegf before surgery, you should get the fitness first. Yes. If the fitness is not there, you have injected, you will not be able to do the surgery. There can be a rebound phenomenon. It is not only regression of the vessels, there can be aggressiveness of the vessels if you delay the surgery after giving the anti vgf injection, which is again a danger. Everyone should remember that. But main question is, uh, in which cases do you give? Or do you give uh, routinely uh, no, not, before PDR surgery? Probably not all the cases. Yes. Not all the cases. Patient, those are having, again, I would say, iris or angle neovascularization, yes. Very, very fluid proliferation, yes. Where you have very extensive proliferation, where you anticipate extensive dissection, yes. So very select group of cases. We already fibrous proliferation. Probably you do not have to give injection. Not all the cases bleed. You have a small isolated attachment here and there, not really necessary. So it's not given as a routine. No, it is in a, a selected cases where there is an aggressive vascular component to the fibrovascular fronts and where there is extensive fibro, uh, fibrovascular proliferation. In those cases, you need to give so that intraoperative bleeding will be minimal in these cases. So basically when surgeon who is operating during his evaluation feels that there is a possibility of extensive bleeding during surgery, yes, I mean, so that may be the indication. Not every case. Yes. Thanks, Rolika, any more? There is another question, sir. What would be the protocol to be followed in patients with vitreous hemorrhage? We, I think I, I, we have gone through yeah, exactly the yes, same sir. slide. So if we have, as I said, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, different scenarios for five, six, I already described. If there's no, if there's a minimal vitreous hemorrhage, you can add laser, please do that. If you cannot see the fundus, do ultrasonography. If it's a fresh hemorrhage, then, and if there's no ultra DRD or RD on ultrasonography, have a close follow-up, maybe two to three weeks. And if patient is already have a laser, again, safely, you can wait and watch. But otherwise, close follow-up, wait for him to clear every two to three weeks, you repeat ultrasonography. And if, as if him keeps on clearing, keep on adding laser as much as you can till you complete the PRP. If him doesn't clear, or you have underlying detachment, or, or uh, neovascularization of iris, or glaucoma, obviously that is indication for early vitrectomy. Young diabetics, probably early vitrectomy is advised. Bilateral involvement, obviously you want to go early because patient is handicapped. Underlying detachment, early vitrectomy is recommended. One eight patients, and uh, <laughs> if there is a professional demand for him to recover uh, early, then probably that is an early indication. Uh, Pramod, what is your opinion about uh, anti-vasives in cases of 
PDR where there is no traction, nothing is there, only vitreous hemorrhage, which you have shown a case where uh, there is a uh, moderate vitreous hemorrhage is there. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your opinion about it? Uh, routinely, I won't advise because with the injection, you do not know. I mean, if particularly media is hazy, you do not know what is happening underneath. Particularly ultrasound, flat proliferation, you can miss. And if you inject those eyes and you can land up in a crunch phenomena, you may have a difficulty. Theoretically speaking, yes, there was a logic. So somebody was talking about if you isolated one or two attachments, incomplete PVD, no proliferation, the act of injection itself and contraction probably help us to induce the PVD. That is one. And second thing, probably when you inject and when you are waiting for VTM to clear, probably it helps you to buy that window of prevent further, I mean, recurrence of him with a pre-existing him. So, but yes, if you can't see the fundus, I won't inject. Okay, Rolika, any other questions? Yes, sir. There's another question, sir, that is that is close monitoring with good systemic control an option in cases with early PDR with no DME or would you like to intervene? That can be an acceptable option. And in fact, like uh, uh, Ajit initially said, we are old people, old, old days. In fact, before this uh, high-risk PDR days, this isolated single proliferation flat and NVEs, we used to... Uh, observe those patients closely. And if you have a very strict monitoring of uh, your blood uh, diabetes mm -hmm. and close follow-up, quite some time we have seen that even those uh, new vessels and even microaneurysms have regressed on their own. But if high-risk character or if patient is not, it cannot follow, or you are having a associated soft exudates, or you have extensive uh, capillary non-perfusion, yes, it's unlikely will regress. And as per the ETDRS criteria, what we know that if you treat early, probably long-term outcome, visual gain is far better in these eyes. So, so with time, we all learn protocol, things change. Now, probably most of the people prefer to treat. Yeah. We have yeah, seen exactly. several cases where there is flat NV. It is not raised NV. Yeah. Raised NV always an indication for panretinal photocoagulation, but flat NV is there. We have closely observed and nothing has happened for quite some time. Yeah. Yes. And uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Rolika, we have time or uh, shall we close? We have just line? one last question, sir. So that would cover all the questions if it's not a problem. And I think you've already answered that question. But uh, someone has asked that when would you like to do ILM peeling in patients with PDR with tractional retinal detachment? So... Well, that's uh, again a debatable, controversial question. Uh, if in a diabetic uh, RDs, most of the time is a tractional component. And if you relieve traction completely properly and you are sure that you are relieved, I personally do not peel ILM. I know there are a lot of people, they peel ILM, all diabetic, uh, macular edema associated, and all, most of the people, they are going in, they peel ILM, my indication probably if you have associated macular hole along with uh, diabetic TRD, but even that also sometimes once you relieve the traction because this is this this is stretch hole because of pre-retinal proliferation. If you remove that, yes. most of the time hole closes on its own. Though there is an argument favoring that that if you peel ILM, you ensure that entire traction is relieved, and quite a few people and particularly even for non-resolving edema, people are using ILM peeling. Personally, I do not do. So but it's like an individual choice. I would leave that one. Yeah. When the macular surface is smooth, after uh, relieving all the membranes, probably it is not required to deal with the ILM. Whereas if there are wrinkles are there in the macular center, probably you need to go for ILM peeling. Uh, macular hole depends on uh, this thing, but it's always macular hole when it is present, you give additional ILM peeling, it is always better. Okay. Yes, uh, Thank you so much, sir. Santosh Thank has not come, so much. shall we continue? Sorry, sir. Santosh has not come, so shall we continue? Sorry, for one more? <laughs> well, we, we will stop, I think, now. 9.30, have another webinar. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, thanks a lot. No, no, usually we sir. stop at na uh, nine o'clock. So, uh, Very much you there. No, no, you can continue if you have discussion. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I have one more, uh, one more yes, question. One more question, Pramod. 
that is also required that is uh, dme active dme is there and the cataract is there mm -hmm. uh, how do you proceed with that yeah, what because I did not answer because uh, Santos said deal with the PDR. So, so, so if the no, diabetic macular one of your is slides there. actually, uh, there was yes. a passing mention. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, correct. I would not have asked. No, 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 correct. Because I wanted to finish in time. Basically, if diabetic macular edema is there, the indic prime first thing is we treat DME, stabilize it, and then do cataract surgery. But if cataract is dense enough and you cannot assess properly, the option is right on the table, you do cataract along with giving intravitreal anti -VEGF. Or if you do not have facility or cataract surgery, not compatible enough injecting, maybe immediately after surgery, you can give anti -VEGF. Assess the fundus and then depending on additional, if you have a PDR changes or only NPDR changes, whatever additional you would like to do, go ahead. But always when you have a DME and with the presence of DME, doing cataract surgery with DME, then overall prognosis is not that good. DME definitely worsens almost 70 to 80% of the cases. So if possible, stabilize the DME and then do cataract surgery. When the media is um, good, clear enough, even in the presence of cataract, then you should deal with the DME and DME first, try yes. to dry it up and then go for cataract surgery. I agree, I agree. 100%. However, if the density of cataract is so much that there is no visibility, probably you can uh, uh, do the cataract surgery either on the table USS or post immediate post-operative USS and immediately start the treatment for DME. Yes, okay, sir. Actually, th thank you so much uh, for asking that question because that kind of connects the previous lecture and this lecture also. So uh, I hope the postgraduates are able to um, make a link out there. As I mentioned last time that DME is a very important part and you should focus on that too. No, there is that's another that's question is that Divya has asked yes, post cataract surgery after how long should we give anti -VGF? How long in the sense? You can mean, give what is the spacing? Either you can give on the table or post-operatively whenever you detect there is an active DME, you can exactly. give. There is no objection for that. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank I you think, so much, uh, sir. Rolika, it is time to... Yes, sir. Thank you, Pramod, sir. And thank you, Ajit, sir, for taking the discussion. Thanks a lot. And thank you all the postgraduates. And I would like yeah. to mention that it has nearly been 21 months that iFocus has been online. And uh, we'll be going on because the show must always go on. And uh, the next session is a special session for all the hot seat participants because there are several hot seat participants who have covered more than 10 classes. And there's a little surprise for all of them in the next session. So stay tuned and uh, be there. Our next session is going to be on March 2nd. That will be screening strategies for diabetic retinopathy. Is it only for hot seats or someone else? Sorry, sir. Is it only for hot sheets or other people else? So the hot seat participants are actually really trying their level best. In fact, they read up. I am indicating the them. chairs. <laughs> Santosh knows it. He's just smiling. Right, sir. Well, thank you again. Uh, thank you so once again very much. Uh, and uh, thank you, Santosh. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, Rolika, for having me here. It's really enjoyed this uh, Presentation we and really enjoyed your presentation. It, it was yeah. totally most important. Uh, we got enough time and to have growing and uh, it covered everything. The breadth of presentation is very good. Thank you so much. Thank you, and then have a nice we weekend. You, you want to say Shabhala. something? Next. Yeah, please so, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, sir, next, uh, no, I just wanted to thank Pramod for his wonderful talk. And the next talk will be by an international faculty that's international keynote lecture by Dr. Soba Shiva Prasad on uh, screening strategies in diabetic retinopathy, which is a main question for postgraduates. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.